Good evening and uh, welcome to another Northshire live event. Um, my name is Dawith Wood and I am I'm the Northshire's uh, event manager in, Man in our Manchester, Vermont location. And I'm here as almost always with my good friend and colleague, Rachel Person. She's the event manager at Northshire's Saratoga Springs, New York location. Uh, and she's gonna introduce our authors tonight. And, 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 uh, but, but before we get started, just a few quick notes. As you have seen, we are recording uh, tonight's event for uh, later perpetuity on our YouTube channel, but have no fear. Uh, all of the audience is set to come in muted and you won't be recorded. Your face won't appear. Only those of us speaking in the nice yellow box. So for that reason, please type your questions if you have them for our authors in the chat box at any time tonight. Rachel and I will save them up and then ask them at the end. And finally, uh, before things get started, just a note of thanks. It's been a hard year and several months now, um, plus for independent bookstores and independent businesses of all cases, of all kinds. And um, we couldn't be out here, we're here without your help and support. So we really appreciate it. Um, Rachel, please take us away. I am so excited to get to be the one to welcome these two authors to Northshire Live tonight. These are two um, huge bookseller favorites in both of our locations um, and customer favorites, and it's really an honor. Um, Elizabeth Letts is the number one New York Times bestselling author of The $80 Champion and The Perfect Horse, which won the 2017 Penn Center USA Literary Award for Research Nonfiction, as well as the novel Finding Dorothy. A lifelong horsewoman, she's with us tonight to talk about her new book, The Ride of Her Life, which is already a huge hit with our customers. We're delighted that she'll be interviewed with tonight by Melanie Benjamin, the New York Times bestselling author of Myth Mistress of the Ritz, The Girls in the Picture, Swans of Fifth Avenue, The Aviator's Wife, The Autobiography of Mrs. Tom Thumb, Alice Have I Been, and most recently, The Children's Wizard. Please join me in welcoming them both to Northshire Live. Hi. Thank so, you. Thank you so much for having us. I'm so excited to be here. And I want to just uh, kind of get the ball rolling by telling you a little bit about the book, uh, The Writer for Life, uh, which is um, the, the third in my series of true stories about horses. Um, I believe that horses reveal a lot about humans and about human society. Um, and so I'm fascinated by stories that that tell a story of a horse and a human relationship through which we can learn something about the way that the world was at that time. The Ride of Her Life is a true story. And it's a story of a woman who lived in a small town in Maine and was completely at the end of her rope. She was 62 years old. She had been very ill and uh, had been given a prognosis of two to four years to live. She was a small family farmer who had lost her farm to back taxes. And her only option that was presented to her was to go live in the county charity home. She had no family to, to support her. She just had a very little dog who was kind of her best friend. But there was something about this woman who, you know, for, for other reasons would seem to be completely ordinary that made her decide that the last chapter of her life story hadn't yet been written, that she wanted to do something different. She had always dreamed of seeing the Pacific Ocean just once before she died. And the more she thought about it, the more she thought that she would rather try to spend those two years trying to get there than do anything else. So she found a broken down old racehorse named Tarzan. She took her little dog. And she set off from Maine in November, hoping to beat the snow and hoping to see if she could make it all the way to California. Well, Elizabeth, I love the book. You know, I love the book. I got to read it uh, before it was published. And I just told you it was going to be huge because I really think it's a story we need right now is America is like kind of venturing forth again and discovering, you know, going to new places and traveling. And, and so much of Annie's journey, I think, will speak to us right now. And first of all, I also wanted to say happy birthday to you. Oh, thank because you. Today is your birthday. So happy birthday, Elizabeth. <laughs> I, I ha did you have a nice day? Did you have a good celebration? Well, <laughs> or are you I mean, having a good celebration? I had a very odd day because I actually am packing up my house and I'm getting ready to move. Um, in just a few days. And so my birthday has been a little bit, a little bit strange, but I am going to have a little celebration a little okay. bit later after this. A lot of my family is uh, on the road right now. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's kind of a big moment in my life right now. Um, I wow. feel like in some ways I was kind of inspired by Annie Wilkins, this idea that you could just kind of go off and figure, you know, do something new. Um, yeah. But yes, thank you. Well, um, so 
any story, there's so many great things about this. And one thing that just occurred me to me today is, you know, it is about a horse, a woman and a horse and a dog. And they they travel from Maine to California. But one of the things that struck me today was the realization that I think we forget that horses are transportation. And yeah. I think that's, you know, your other books aren't, were, were about a racehorse, right? And, and a show horse, right? Mm-hmm. Or a prize stallion. So this is about the horse as transportation. A woman in 19, what, 1953? Was it when she started? 1954 when she set 54, out, yes. Who, who, you know, that was when Dinah Shore was singing See the USA in your Chevrolet, and she gets on a horse because yes. it's like her logical, like, well, I wouldn't go to the sea, California, so I guess I'll get on a horse and do it. I mean, this, tell us a little bit about Annie's upbringing and, and why that was the logical means of transportation for this particular woman at this time. Well, you're right. I mean, when we think about the 19, mid-1950s, absolutely the most important, biggest thing on the horizon was the explosion of cars. Mm-hmm. That in, in the, ni- the decade, I mean, we had cars obviously before that, but one of the things I discovered in researching this book was that it was the 1950s when the car just really exploded as a cultural phenomenon. This is the post-war era. This is, we all know that this is an era of suburbanization when the suburbs were being built, people were moving out with their cars. There was also marketing. Uh, it, it, the people who had been fortunate enough to have a car prior to that, they would have one car, the family car. And you start to get to a time where the, the market for cars is exploding. And so now it's not just the family car, but maybe the, the father and the mother are both going to have a car and even the, sometimes the teenagers. And then because there were so many cars on the roads, they, we started thinking a lot about uh, roads and transportation and building new roads. And of course, that culminated in the Interstate Highway Act of 1956. Um, in the 1950s, one in six Americans was employed in the automobile industry. One in six. I mean, it was a gigantic industry. And as I was researching this, I I look at newspapers a lot. And if you look at uh, newspapers from the mid-1950s, you cannot miss the number of advertisements that there are for cars, like you said, the Chevrolets and the, and this were, you know, the big fins and the chrome and so many things that we think of as being really iconic um, for the middle of the 20th century. in America. So we all know about the car. So now what is this about the horse? And so in order to understand that, I think you have to go back before 1950, another another 30 years or 20 years to the 1930s. If you were a family farmer in the United States, if you were a person who had inherited a small farm, maybe you'd been working it for two or three generations, and you had this kind of ideal that you were gonna be self-sufficient and earn your own living, the 1930s, the Great Depression was really the death knell for so many people. That was kind of the end of that as a viable uh, uh, economic option for most people. So you have Annie Wilkins, and Annie Wilkins has been on this family farm, and they and they were getting poorer and poorer and poorer throughout the Depression. She manages to hold on till 1953. In 1954 is when she sets out on this journey. So why doesn't she get a car? Well, she didn't have a drive. She didn't have any money. I mean, logically speaking, maybe Annie Wilkins could have got a bus ticket, or maybe even a train ticket. She could have gotten an airplane ticket, I uh, didn't have that kind of money. So she she represented a, a view of the world that was really much more of a 19th century view where you could get on a horse and you could ride or maybe get a buggy and you could ride and go west. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm very fascinated by that, those times where two really different mindsets are kind of bumping up against each other at the same time. Older people who still really think of the agrarian world farm America, and then this explosion of this new technology that's changing the world so fast that you can barely keep up. Why did Annie want to go to California in the first place or see the Pacific Ocean? I mean, what was the thing that made her do that? Well, I mean, so I I grew up in LA and um, I live in Los Angeles right now. So I'm going to say like, of course she wanted to go to California. (laughs) But I mean, a woman from Maine who doesn't have a television, what was it that made her want to go? It it was actually, it was something that her mother told her as a child. Uh, Her mother, in the middle of winter, every year in the middle of winter, her mother, at some point, she'd just say, you know, someday we ought to hitch up a buggy and we ought to go west (laughs) and go see the Pacific Ocean and buggy. And and interestingly, if you, I did a lot of research back into Annie's family tree and looked at the farm and her family farm, the history of it. It had been purchased with funds that were earned by 
a family member who had gone west. There had been a part of her family who had gone west um, in the 1860s, 1870s, made enough money to come back to Maine and purchase land. And that was that farm. And it was the biggest kind of accomplishment in her, you know, in several generations of, of her family to get mm. that farm. And so she was going to hold it at all costs until she couldn't anymore. But that's mm. where she got the idea of California. It was kind of that go west, you know, idea. But again, by 1950, that wasn't a thing anymore. People weren't hitching up buggies and going west. So she, so Annie decides to get this horse, Tarzan, and she has her little dog, Depeche Trois, on um, kind of on a rope <laughs> they're going, as they're leaving. Kind right? of on a rope, yeah, clothesline, yeah. really. Yeah, clothesline. <laughs> <laughs> and so she sets off from Maine. Tell us how in that age, before there was GPS on your smartphone or Google Maps, how did she piece together her route? And, and, and I found her route very, very fascinating because it is not at all a logical route west. She took right. some really interesting <laughs> um, uh, side trips, I guess you could say. Yeah. So how did she piece together her route? Well, one of the most fascinating things to me about writing this book was getting to go back and revisit an America that seems close enough in time and yet is actually so, so distant. Because when you look at the before and after of America, before and after interstates and big highways, it was a really different, uh, it was a really different country. We were a network of small towns attached to each other by roads. And interestingly, like even the way the roads looked was different. So a town would be a hub. And then the roads, usually they kind of went out for like spokes on the wheel from the town. So there, it, there were direct, there were roads, but they were de designed to go not to long distances, but just kind of near from nearby place to place to bring, uh, generally speaking, they were, they were intended to bring goods into the town and then bring goods back out of the town to the farms. We were a rural agrarian country. Uh, and, and so the, the roads still, still were built like that. Um, so what she did is she just get on, got on her horse and rode to the next town. And when you're in, in Maine or New England, I mean, that really makes a lot of sense because those towns were built in an era when, as you said, the horse was transportation. So towns tended to be about a day's ride apart. A horse plodding along at a leisurely pace goes about three miles an hour. Very brisk walker may walk four miles an hour. Um, it, that means that you can pretty easily make it you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 miles in a day. So that's about how far apart little towns are mostly uh, in New England. Uh, so when she started off, she didn't have to ride that far before she would get to the next town. And likely, because we were also a country of, of um, neighborly connectedness, the likelihood that someone in this town knew someone in the next town was really high, like basically 100%. So, you know, if you were in this town, you could say, well, uh, hey, look up so-and-so, my cousin lives there, my friend lives there, you would know somebody down the road. You would know people, maybe two, three towns down the road, you didn't know anyone anymore, but by then they knew someone. And that was kind of this chain of connectedness that you saw um, that's very striking if you're looking at it from a 21st century perspective. Well, it's, it's social networking in, you know, before there was the internet, right? And, and it's, yeah. I, I find that really fascinating about this book, how the word started to spread and people started to look for her on her way, right? Even before she got major publicity, it right. was word of mouth, right? She, she went viral. <laughs> She did. She was a she was a viral phenomenon in her own way. Um, and again, it's that it's that speed. Um, but if if you look at this time period, 1954 to 1956, there are some very very interesting things happening technologically at that time. So in addition to cars, the other big one was television. And what I discovered was sure there were TVs, uh, but between 1954 and 1955, that was when the ability to broadcast TV really, really expanded. So there were shows being produced and there were people, uh, there were some networks broadcasting, but your average person in a mid-sized town couldn't really easily get TV until about that time period. And all of a sudden, every, every mid-sized town, mid town in America started being able to broadcast. Um, and so as they were broadcasting into local areas, they started covering some local stories. And Annie did start getting picked up, not just by the newspapers, uh, but also by uh, the television. And that was really interesting because they just, it's kind of like us with tweets, you know, these yeah. crazy stories where ha people had no idea that a tweet could, could 
travel like that. They go to sleep and in the morning they're famous. Well, that's what television felt like then. You know, you would be on, obviously the local news had a kind of a fast penetration that they hadn't really been able to experience before. So Annie rides into town, kind of a figure of curiosity, but all of a sudden it's not just word of mouth, but sometimes she's actually getting mentioned on television. And if not television, the other thing was, made me kind of sad, honestly, was the local newspaper phenomenon. Every mm-hmm. single little town had a newspaper and each one of those newspapers wrote their own stories. They had their yeah. own reporters and they wrote about local, I mean, teeny little towns. And then there would be the bigger one and then kind of the city. So um, people could, that was how they shared news. It would be in the local paper and then local people would read about it. So. Um, mm-hmm. So that was how she, she, you know, went viral 1950s style. Yeah, and that's so sad today. I'm just reading, I mean, I'm from, I live in Virginia now, but I'm from Chicago was where I spent, so, you know, most of my adult life and the Chicago Tribune just got bought by this huge media and everyone's yeah. leaving. I mean, everyone's taking buyouts and they're all gone. It's just so sad. Anyway, I digress. But how do you find, I do you subscribe to newspapers.com or newspaper archives or I'm, I'm trying to remember oh, for what research I, for research. I subscribe to one of those and I can't mm-hmm. remember. Is it the archives one? I can't remember. Yes, I use, yeah. well, actually I, I should say it's interesting because um, there are these uh, newspaper aggregating sources that yeah. are really useful for research. And mm-hmm. I subscribe to as many as I can just because they don't all carry the same little local newspapers. Right. But it is really mm-hmm. fascinating because sometimes in the tiniest little newspapers, I would find a, some little tidbit in the story that I was just breaking my head trying to find out some detail of Annie's life or something that happened. And, um, you know, then there would just, there it would be in one in one newspaper story. Um, In particular, Annie was a very colorful person. She had been in vaudeville. Uh, She was, she was twice divorced. Um, And she was a very independent minded woman. She wore men's clothes. Um, She was bold and kind of quirky. And what was interesting was that as I would, a a lot of the um, newspaper articles about her were, went nationwide through the AP wire service. And in those, her real personality was kind of, you know, sanded down and, and made more proper for polite company. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, she was called the widow Wilkins and she was not any kind of a widow. She was actually, you know, Divorced. actually one of her husbands <laughs> was a horse thief and the other one I had to run off. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, eventually I would find it. And what was so fascinating to me was I realized that it wasn't Annie who was censoring herself. It was the newspapers that were censoring her. So if you get far enough out into one of these local papers, you would get much more of the real story. And I found that fascinating too. Well, yeah, the 1950s was a different time for women, right? And there were certain expectations and um, yeah, I can totally see that they, that that was their spin. That's what's, I think when you're researching, isn't that the challenge, right? To kind of like pull the curtain and try to see, okay, what is the, how much of this is the reporter's viewpoint yeah. versus what is the real reality it's it's a challenge as a researcher what right. and I you... think I think you know because we're both here and because we both write historical uh, works I think that that's something that people would probably be very interested in so you're working in fiction and this book is nonfiction. but the mm-hmm. overlap between I think what we do and how we approach it is probably pretty similar I mean I think it's fascinating that you that you use the newspaper archives too uh, oh, which yeah. turn up well, is really it, fascinating it, for me it's 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 well, it's just wonderful. Like I don't even just don't I don't read just the article that I'm looking for. It's, I'm looking at the whole thing because that's how that's my that's how I'm going to try to create a world for the reader that, you know, to try to pull them into this different time. So mm-hmm. it's very helpful for me to read those newspapers to, to your point, the ads for the cars. I mean, it gives yeah. you a better sense of what society, what that world was like. So I find yes. it very, very helpful. But yeah, in anything that I do, and I'm sure you do too, when it's someone else writing about this person that we are trying to research, you have to be like a detective, yeah. right? Yeah. To find, to, to kind of, again, don't get caught up in what the person who's writing about this person says about them. You've got to find, you got to somehow find the real person beneath all that. Yes. And it's, it's it's like sleuthing. It's like becoming a It is. I mean, and that's one of the things that I just, 
I love, and, I, and I'm sure you yeah. do too. Those are the things that make me um, love what I do so much, so passionate yeah. about it. And, and, and I am a digger and I dig and I dig and I dig and I dig and I, and I know Melanie that you do too, because that's what I, I'm a very big fan of Melanie's books as well as being her friend. And um, it's that, it's that uh, desire. And it's, it's so fascinating. And I have to tell you, I have um, in my last book, The Perfect Horse, which was a World War II story, I, I interviewed a man who was the son of the um, German commandant who was running this secret Nazi stud farm um, in Czechoslovakia, really interesting man. And at one point he said to me, he was a retired pathologist. He said, what you do reminds me of what I do. And I was oh. like, what I do reminds, <laughs> reminds me of what you do, You're, you are a pathologist. And he said, yeah, he said, I peer into the microphone. I mean, I'm sorry, the microscope. And I look and I try to figure out like what happened based on all these cellular changes and different things. And he said, you're peering into the past and you're trying to find out what happened. You're kind of putting the pieces together. I thought that was so insightful. I thought it was that fascinating. Is. But I think you and both of us have challenges though, because, um, you know, you, you when you go, and, and I wanted you to tell us about how you traced Annie's path, um, your your research in that way, because, and I've done this before too, with the girls in the picture when I had to go, to, when I went to Hollywood, the Hollywood that I was writing about doesn't exist anymore. So when you mm -hmm. go to these real places for research, um, part of it's fun. <laughs> because it's a tax write-off, it's research. And part of it is, you know, you're working, but it's the hard part is again, the, it doesn't look the same anymore. So, so tell us about how you then were successful or unsuccessful in actually tracing Annie's actual path, because I imagine some of the roads she took don't exist anymore. And they certainly I mean, don't look the same. Yeah, I mean, actually, so that's a great question. So I did retrace her route. I started, um, with, I started simply um, putting together like going using Google Maps and just taking every single place name that I could find that she was associated with and um, trying to trace her route that, route that way. And it was very difficult to trace her route that way because mm -hmm. um, because of the changes in the roads. Yeah. Um, the inter the interstate. I mean, start spending some time looking at 1950s maps, which I did. Get old gas station maps. And that's when it really gets into your mind how different our country is after yeah. the inter interstate. So as soon as I started looking at old fashioned maps and looking at paper maps and not using Google Maps, her route started to make a lot more sense because most of the time she was actually following the main roads, uh, what were then the main roads. And most roads are still there. Um, and you know, for those of you in the audience who are maybe road tripper people, um, one of my very favorite things is to drive along a road. There's one in, um, when I was going through Arkansas, uh, the highway, I think it's, I believe it's 70, but don't quote me on that, that goes across um, Arkansas from Memphis. The old main road runs exactly parallel to it, but it's only about two miles off, two miles south of it. And so, you, all of these little towns that Annie was riding that that what is now a secondary road and it's just lined with town after town after town most of which are really very depressed and kind of not off the beaten path shall we say not on the main drag anymore mm -hmm. um so once you get off that main road and you follow that secondary road you start to see the old filling stations and the old motor courts and all the kinds of things that we associate with uh, 1950s travel yeah so did you, so did, were you able to trace her entire route or, or just parts of it? I think, I'm trying to think if, I mean, I think there may be, there were a few little places that I actually did not go through myself, mm -hmm. but for the, by and large, and I, I, I had, I had a vision of, of, you know, this epic journey um, where I would start at one end and go to the other and, you know, in my mind on horseback, but in reality, because of the constraints of time, I actually have a, a son who's still in high school and, you know, I, I couldn't get that much time. So I did it in chunks. Um, the first part I did, I started up in Maine and then I did uh, from the West, I went westward. And then at one point I did, uh, I went down to Kentucky and I drove that whole route. So, um, and it, it is very, it was, interesting to get off the main road like that. I mean, yeah. to follow her route meant to go to places that a lot of times people don't necessarily drive through anymore. Right. And I thought that was really fascinating. One time we tried to trace Route 66, just from Chicago to St. Louis. And because we, that's when we were still in Chicago. You, you can't, I mean, you know, you have to constantly get on and off and on and off and on right. and off. 
55 to do it. And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's yeah. a challenge. Now, why did, so how long did it take Annie? From well, it took her, to it took her almost two years. Yeah. Right. And she thought she could do it. Like if leaving in November and getting there before the snow fell originally. I mean, I don't know if, if she thought she would get there. She thought she would get far enough South to get a job. And she figured that she would sort of ride and work and ride and work. What actually happened was because she sort of became this figure of interest, she ended up supporting herself by selling these little postcards. Along the way, she met a woman who took an interest in her, who printed up postcards with um, her picture with her, her horse and her dog, and this poem that was called, uh, a poem that was called, I Think, which is one of those, like, I think I can, I believe that yeah. I can. Yeah. And that was printed on the other side. And mm -hmm. as she would ride into town, people would want her autograph because she was sort of a local celebrity. So she would sign these little cards and charge. She didn't even charge. She would say, you know, give me however much you think. And people would give her a nickel or a dime. And mm -hmm. that was enough to, to get her. Along with a lot of people gave her lodging. Um, a lot of people uh, put her up or gave her a place to stay or gave her food or gave her other kinds of assistance. So um, that was that was what she did. But I don't think, no, she, she her plan was to stay on the road for a couple of years in, in, until she died oh, okay. or, or something happened. She didn't really have too much of a plan. That's why she wasn't too much of a hurry, but she also had no idea. She didn't no. know, no, no GPS, no phone. She didn't have a map of the entire country. She didn't yeah. have an atlas. She started well, to collect up these gas station maps, which are regional. But um, yeah. someone would say, "Why don't you come here? Why don't you come there?" And she'd be like, "Okay." And off I she would go. So she gets down to Kentucky, and it's like that's just not really the most direct route from Maine to California. <laughs> no, and then she goes all the way up to Idaho, and then when she finally gets up to California, she doesn't come into California by any kind of a of a way that would be recommended for a person to enter California. So. <laughs> Yeah. You know, they called her the last of the saddle tramps. And I think that is such an interesting phrase. Can you talk about what that is, uh, what a saddle tramp was? Yeah, she um, she called herself the last of the saddle tramps, the, the saddle tramp being a, a, a hobo on horseback, yeah. being a very familiar figure uh, to people in the 1950s. One of the things you learn about the 1950s from watching TV is that people were obsessed with the Western you know, people yeah. on horseback. And there was a very popular film, I think it was 1954, called um, Saddle Tramps. So she christened herself the last of the Saddle Tramps when she wow. was riding across Kansas. And I, it, very often what happened was that people, the Chamber of Commerce of some of these smaller towns would uh, send her mail. And she was always picking up her mail post rest on, you know, general delivery at the at the post office and um, they would say, come to, so they said, come to Dodge City. It's the, ca it's the cowboy capital of, um, of America. And she did not end up going to Dodge City, but that was the point at which she started calling herself a saddle tramp. And I think, I, I, I think that there was a lot, you can learn a lot about what was happening in the country by looking at why we were so entranced with the Western at the time, mm -hmm. because that was the time when um, people, it was like a, this nostalgia for that, idea that you could somehow just get on a horse and go and that there were you know that at that point those endless vistas they were on back lots in Burbank California um because right. there was a kind of but 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 again it, coming back to what we talked about in the very beginning Annie was born in 1890 so by 1950 you know that the era of of thinking that you know, imagining it was so powerful in the American imagination that there was going to be some empty place that you could go to um yeah. And so by the 1950s that instead people were moving to the suburbs and getting their little lawn and their little yard and their, their fence and their all that. Um, and then they be, people became obsessed with this image of the cowboy. Uh, most of the time it was a man. There were a few uh, shows that actually featured women, Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley, stuff. yeah. I think it's so fascinating. You think of television in those that era. It was I Love Lucy, which was very sophisticated, right? They're in New York, they're in show business. It's kind of a sophisticated thing. And then you had Gunsmoke, right? And they were like the uh -huh. two biggest hits on television in yes. that era. And I think that's just such a, a really interesting. <laughs> right. Well, and then the third one, which which um, I thought was really interesting that I mentioned briefly in the book is Father Knows Best, yeah. Um, yeah. which was your suburban dad. That was kind of that myth of- Ozzy and Harriet was you know, also in there too. suburban family. So yeah. there were a lot of different- it was a time of, of cultural shift. I think yeah. um, I feel that very strongly that it was a time. It was, a, I, I'm very fascinated by these end of an era times where we become entranced with something because we sort of know that it's slipping away. Um, and uh, 
that's definitely the case with that time period. I was I one of the things I love about the book so much is what not just that you the way you capture Annie, um, and I love her humor and her common sense, and she's just such a great character. But the way you captured America at the time, and and I love you know the way that you you kind of go back and forth between Annie's journey, and then you give us just a wonderful little kind of not a lesson because I don't want anyone to think of it in dry terms like that. It's just such a wonderful kind of a travel log, but a history lesson as well of what was going on in America at that time. And that's why I think um, it's such a perfect book to me because you learn a lot of things, of course, and you have this great character, but you, you really are taking the time to educate us about the changes primarily that were happening in America, like you say, with the interstate highway system that's just one example so uh, that's why I love the book so much because I I, I just think you, you can really create the whole picture it's not just Annie's story it's a story of an America that is no longer there and I think it's a nostalgic a warm fuzzy yeah. portrait of this time yeah I think you yeah. know first of all I guess so I'm a road trip lover and I love to drive and I've driven up across the country many, many times in addition to writing this book. And I am one of those people as, as are many people, you, you drive and then there's these little towns and, and then you know there's the signs with the historical markers and, and, and you wonder about them, but particularly if you're somebody like me who grew up in Los Angeles. I mean, I grew up in a suburb, the highway, the freeway was a fact of life when I was born and growing up, it was just there. I never really thought much about what was there before it. Um, <laughs> And I didn't really have a sense other than, you know, I don't know, watching the Andy Griffith show about what maybe, <laughs> and, but I, but I, I, what you find, what you find as she goes from town to town um, in the 1950s is you find one after another, after another, a very archetypal American towns driven by different kinds of economies, but each one of them being something that was just about to really kind of go away or, or change mm -hmm. fundamentally. Right. Um, and you really feel that even though the 1950s was a very prosperous time, you really feel the lingering shadow of the Great Depression. Um, and so in some ways, weirdly, it reminds me a lot of, of now, of, of our contemporary time, because you know she goes to Manchester, New Hampshire, which was a big one company town. And she goes through Windsor Locks, Connecticut, which was driven, it was a, driven by, the, by its location on a river. It was a river town that was all um, involved in shipping. And, and, and then uh, she goes through the town of Marceline, Missouri, uh, which um, she doesn't go through Marceline, but she goes through uh, Marshfield, Missouri, which is very similar to Marceline, uh, the town that uh, Walt Disney based uh, his Main Street Main on. Street, USA. Yeah. And it's no coincidence that Main Street was built by Walt Disney and opened in Anaheim, California in 1956, right about the time when the American uh, highway system was very busily building bypasses around those little towns. So it, it was already but, nostalgic. Yes, and there were, so there were, we had, we had these, these economic units and they weren't all the same, but they were all vibrant and viable in their own way. And most of them, when they really started to lose that economic viability was in, in the 1930s and the depression. So by the 1950s, now you've got this new kind of boom post-war economy, they're building the suburbs and, and building all these cars and it's gonna be a new world, you know, yeah. but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so no. it's a fascinating time. And people are still that very, very kind of thing, though. I mean, certainly she encountered some people who were not so kind to her on the road. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I was just struck by how generous everyone was. Uh, two things. I was struck by how many, because she always had to stable the horses. <laughs> she picked up a second horse. So wherever she stayed, she had there had to be a stable or someplace for mm -hmm. the horses. And I was like surprised when I was reading this too. I was just trying to imagine today, would she find that many, you know, stables and barns mm -hmm. and things for the horses if she was doing this today? And I have to think she probably wouldn't. But also, would she find people as well-intentioned intentioned and kind and not really, not, not, she wasn't in physical danger, right? Except for cars on the road. Mm -hmm. So that well, and, and thing. Lots of threats to her, but most of them were not human threats. Right. you know the weather right. and uh, weather and uh, all kinds of different things but yes yeah. I mean and her yeah. presumption I think 
I mean, what you find, what is so interesting is she has this presumption of trust. Um, uh, now, and I, and I always stop at this point to say that I think it's really important to point out that she was a white woman and the experience of a, of a person of color, a black person traveling in the United States at that time would have been fundamentally different um, because they did not have the same freedom to travel. But, right. but given she was, she was still a woman, it was not so typical for a woman to travel alone. It wasn't no. at all typical at that point to travel on horsebook horseback, but she did right. have this, we had a country in which, at least among white people, this, this idea of social trust was quite prominent. The idea yeah. that if you met someone, you could ex expect them to, to give you a helping hand. Um, you know, I mean, you can call me Pollyanna. Um, I personally think that people are still like that. You know, um, I, I still think that you'll see that. I mean, you see it in California when you have the wildfires, for example, um, mm -hmm. and these terrible situations. Everyone in the horse community mobilizes. I've got a, I've got a horse trailer. I've got a corral. I've got a this. I've got a that. Um, in natural disasters, I mean, it's like you know what what Fred Rogers said about look for the helpers. So I'm not mm -hmm. so cynical. I do think that there are a lot of good people out there still, but certainly the vast majority of Americans do not proceed with an idea that they can automatically trust unless no. proven wrong right. anymore. And you really do notice that. You yeah. notice that in this book. Yeah. I, I, so let's um, describe the end for us as, as far as her triumphant appearance on television, because she did become, she kind of gets her moment of fame by the end of the book. So talk about Art Linkletter and what his show meant and, and, and her triumphant appearance mm -hmm. well art link letter being you know such a huge um uh, figure in television for those of us who are old enough to remember um 1950s 1960s 1970s and he he was started following um annie's story uh it seems like he discovered her about the time that she reached idaho um mm -hmm. But what I found was so interesting that I didn't know about Art Linkletter is I did not know that Art Linkletter himself had had some hoboing days. Um, he he had grown up. Uh, he was the son of a of a evangelical minstrel preacher, and they used to preach on street corners. And when he was about sixteen, he had just uh, had enough, and he took off and he rode the rode the boxcars for a few years. And so uh, I think that he he really um, had an, a real affection for Annie and even later, he, he often said that she was one of his favorite people that he had ever met um, during the years that he was doing the show because mm. she was very authentic and genuine. I mean, she really was doing this uh, just because she wanted to, uh, but but she did end up having, being able to appear on the Art Linkletter show uh, and uh, that just made her uh, really famous for a little <laughs> while. And then did she, um, she, she traveled some more, did she, she did try to, she tried to take at least one more lengthy road trip with the horse, right? Um, I don't think she, she did, she, she went to California, she kind of took a break for a while, she did ride around a little bit for a while, um, but no, I mean, that was pretty much the end of her long okay. distance riding. Okay, okay. Um, I, I, the ASPCA, I mean, it's hard to imagine today that the ASPSA ASPCA would not have gotten a little bit more involved with, you know, a woman on a horse trailing another horse with a dog on busy highways sometimes, or for this long distance trip. And mm -hmm. um, I know she did encounter a couple times concerned citizens who were uh, concerned about the welfare of the animals, but uh, talk about how she treated the animals. I mean, they seem to be very uh, well taken care of the whole trip, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. one of the really key key things and, and yes she did they a couple of times at the ASPCA came out to take a look at the horse and make sure that uh that everything was was okay and he was he was in good shape I mean let's let's put it this way horses are designed to walk that that is what they are meant to do yeah and we forget and, that um, again we forget you know, I think we forget that traveling yeah. long distances and and all that kind of thing and horses were even though um people were not necessarily riding their way across the country at that time either. Still in all, horses were much more a part of everyday life than they are today. Um, people would be much less inclined to think just because a, that a horse shouldn't share the road with the cars or, I mean, even um, tractors by the side of the road, even pedestrians, it was a, it was a different time. Um, she was very solicitous of the horses. It, and I, I had a really interesting conversation uh, recently with uh, an equestrian who's kind of one of the 
biggest, uh, both competitors, Olympic competitor, but also a, a very uh, a historian of the horse. And uh, I asked him that question. I said, you know, do you think this, was she, was she lucky for the horse that she got? Um, or do you think probably any horse would have made? And he said, no, I think she was lucky. I mean, oh. she had a horse. He was, he was a Morgan, you know, nice New England breed. Uh, they were bred to be sturdy and they would uh, plow the fields, the rocky fields of Vermont and Maine and uh, New England. And then they would have log pulling contests on the weekend and then they would race them. And they, they really, and it's a it's kind of quintessential American horse breed. And she had found this Morgan and he was a sturdy horse. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly people, people, we have a different relationship with, with animals. In yeah. Um, and yeah. I mean, the, have, the horses would have their own Twitter accounts today, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you did your research for this book prior to the pandemic, right? I did. Yeah. And so we've talked a little bit about how hard it was to do any research during the pandemic because libraries were closed. You couldn't go, you know, travel and see the places that we normally do. Um, so now that the pandemic's over, are you researching something new? Yeah, well, I should say that I, I fortunately I had finished the lion's share of the research um, for this book before the pandemic hit, but I hope when people are reading the um, this book that they will sense um, I really connected to this character very very deeply, and I, I I felt there was something in the in her in her yearning for her own kind of path and her own independence and 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 the pursuit of freedom for its own sake um, that really resonated with me, and I believe that it was in particular because of the fact that as I was mostly editing this book, you know, I was locked down just like we all were. And there was yeah. something about that courage that she had, um, not even what she did, simply the courage to say, we only got one shot at this, let's do, let's see what we can do with our, our lives, you know, um, yeah. what are you going to do with this one wild and precious life? Um, as the Mary Oliver poem says. And, and Annie was a person, I mean, she had no, she had no particular, why Annie, ordinary person, why? I don't know why. Um, but that was my, that was the thing that really inspired me as I was writing it. And so as far right. as your other question, yes, I'm working oh. on a new book. <laughs> and my next book ask. is fiction. I won't ask, I know you can't always <laughs> say. But no, I think that is why the book appealed to me too, just exactly what you said. As we came out of this very dark year, to read about a woman who was told she was going to die, you know, and, um, and, and sell her home and go live in public assistance and who said, no, I'm going to get on a horse and go see California instead. I mean, she yes. chose life over death basically. Yes. And I think yes. that is a lesson for all of us. And, and, and at an age when, oh, she was 60, how old was she? 60, she, she was 60, 63 when she set off 62 63. at the beginning 63. of the book. But in those days, I mean, that's, that's elderly. I mean, you would, oh yeah. You know, now you would probably more say somebody would be more like 72, 73 at the least. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell my husband that. People <laughs> training it themselves. So. <laughs> but, um, 60 yeah. 40, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's it. I mean, and the other thing too is it's like, okay, most of us are not going to ride a horse across the country or really ever do anything that's even quite that dramatic. But all of us have something that we're holding ourselves back from because we don't have the materials or maybe the money or the time or, or people would laugh at us. We don't quite have the guts, whatever. We all have that thing. And Annie had nothing except just kind of simple faith in herself and a desire to see if she could try. And that was what really marked me because, yeah. you know, yeah, you can, you can do something more than you think you can if you set out to do it. Right. And I think I think everybody could use a little of Annie Wilkins in your life right now. I truly do. So bravo, Elizabeth. I love the book so much. You know, thank you. you know. So I think we're going to do some questions now. Yes, we have some questions from the audience and audience members, please feel free to type any questions that you have in the chat. We will get to as many of them as we can. Um, the first one is from Fran um, asking Elizabeth, how did you first hear about Annie? I first, I first came across her story, um, just like a little, it was a very short account of it. Um, and, you know, because I'm interested in horses, I'm constantly reading, you know, this and that and this and that. And, and I was reading it when I came across this last of the saddle tramps woman. Um, 
and she just never left my mind. I kept wondering about her and wondering, and I honestly wasn't sure that there, it would be, it seemed to me that it would be a difficult story to research. And that's why I didn't necessarily pursue it right away, but I kept thinking about her and thinking about her. And finally I thought, I really wanna tell this story. Thanks so much. Carolyn has a couple of, of comments um, that she wanted to share. She says, I love how you included elements of Anne's timeline without it sounding intrusive to Anne's story. And then she also follows up by saying your book, The $80 Champion, also went into uh, how the horse was being phased out as a working animal central to people's lives. Uh, and this really drives it home. Is there any more you want, can share on that? Um, yes, well, as I, I mentioned, I'm fascinated by end, end of an era stories. And I'm fascinated with the horse in the 20th century because um, what you find is that it, people saw the horse so as so central to the human endeavor that even as it was being surpassed by technology, people were still holding on to that. And um, and I, I I find there's something really fascinating about when I mean the, the 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 horse has such a rich culture around it, sporting and breeding. Uh, race race horses, which is obviously Saratoga Springs. I mean, it's not just the horses and the races, it's actually the farriers and the breeders and the pasture experts and the people who's, who do the saddles and the silks and the jockeys and, and, and in each, and that's one facet of horses. And then in each facet, and, and then all of a sudden, well, the horse isn't the thing anymore. And what do you do with all of that? Um, and you really do, you see this in the story um, because it highlights what the country was becoming for people who had grown up in a farming, in a farming world. And what was happening as that world was being changed into the world that I was born into. It's not so long ago, you know? Fascinating, thank you. Um, Joan asks, are you familiar with the current long rider Bernice Ende? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but E-N-D-E. -E. I don't think so, no. It's interesting that there is that there is a culture of long riding still existing. There is more than you would more than you would think. And there are people I've, I've been in a lot of discussions about could you do this today? Could you do it today? You couldn't do it in the exact same way, but people certainly still try. Um, one of the first interviews I did was um, with a, the president of the Horse Camping and Trails Association of America. And we immediately became best friends, you know, and uh, I said, oh, I really, really wanted to retrace part of Annie's journey from, from Cheyenne to Laramie on horseback. She was like, we can do that. Can I go with you? So yeah, there's, there are still, um, it's a long tradition. Annie is one, one of them. I did read a lot of different accounts of long riders um, as I was sort of deciding whether this was the story that I wanted to tell. Um, but it is a long tradition, a literary tradition, as well as just a tradition of people doing it doing it and then writing about it, long tradition. But the Bernice we'll end, I'm not sure, I'll have, to, I'll have to find out about her. I was gonna say, um, thank you, but uh, Carolyn has another question. She says, why did you choose to tell Annie's story as nonfiction rather than a, a biographical um, novel? Oh yeah, well, I mean, being as I'm one of the few writers who kind of bumps back and forth from fiction to nonfiction, I, um, I think with Annie's story, it, the, the fact that the story itself is true is um, a lot of what gives it the, the power. Um, I think a, a novel about a person riding a horse across the country might be interesting, but with Annie, we're fascinated by her because, because, she, because she did this thing. She actually achieved something that was by any measure extraordinary. So very much like in the $80 champion when I wrote about a, a, you know, an immigrant who found a, a plow horse at the slaughterhouse and, and managed to win the national championships. It's those long, long odds. You can write novels about them, but they tend to have more power when they're really true stories, I think. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Susanna asks, um, did you meet any colorful people during your research who remembered Annie? Yes, one of the, the most uh, rewarding things for me about writing um, nonfiction is the relationships that I develop with um, some of the people who are, um, who are, you know, involved in the story. 
and I go out and it, it, it can be really sometimes surprisingly difficult to track people down. Um, but then you do track people down and they tell you their stories. And one of the ones, there's a, there's a, a story in the, this book about Annie visiting um, a, a place called the Roses Riding Academy in, um, and it's in uh, New Jersey, outside of Newark, New, Newark, New Jersey. Um, just kind of these people, they, they had a, it was sort of, it was in a, just kind of on the edge of a very urban neighborhood. They had a menagerie of animals. And, and so Annie had uh, written a memoir and, I, and the memoir would, would kind of dance in and out of, of sort of fact. So I would, I used that as a resource, but it was hard to tell. She never, she, she started talking about these people and they had a zebra and they had the monkeys, they had monkeys. And, 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 and it was confusing because it sounded like they were in um, somewhere in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so I did all this research, anybody, in, you know, calling all these people, anyone know anyone in Lancaster, Pennsylvania who had monkeys? No, nobody knows. So finally, though, I did, I found um, the daughter of the people who owned the Roses Riding Academy. And it turns out that I was simply in the wrong place. It was um, not White, White Horse, Pennsylvania. It was White Horse, uh, Hamilton Township, Township, New Jersey. And dig and dig and dig. And sure enough, I find these people, they had been uh, rodeo riders and, and circus animal trainers, and they had monkeys and they had trick horses. And they used to, the kids in the neighborhood that was there, they were um, known for the fact that if, if people, there's a lot of factories, if the parents had to work, they would have their kids get off the bus at the riding academy so that they could uh, just get riding lessons. And, and the, they said there was always a, a pony around or something. Um, but uh, I thought that was just so much fun because uh, it was really difficult for me to figure it out. But when I finally found this daughter and she told me the whole story of the family and they were such fascinating people. That's amazing. Um, I wondered, you know, clearly you've done a ton of research, um, but there's always sort of an endless pile of research that you could do. Um, did you find yourself having to cut yourself off? Could you have just gone on endlessly? Um, or was yes. there sort of a natural stopping point? Point. No, well, I mean, there was a natural stopping point, which was, it was a, <laughs> the, I mean, when you write a, a book about a road trip from a, a writing structure perspective, it's really interesting because um, you don't have to decide how you're going to put the story together because there's really this, it's given to you. It's a, um, you know, it's episodic and, it, and so that, but as far as the research, yeah, I mean, there were many things. Um, and I think, you know, as I, as, as I was editing the book, there were probably things that I had thought in my mind that I would keep looking into them. Uh, but at that point with the pandemic, the, you know, it, it was, became very difficult to get to certain resources. So fortunately my research was all pretty much done there. Um, but yeah, you can dig indefinitely. Um, I took inspiration from um, the, the historian, Nathaniel Philbrick, um, who I'm a big fan of his. And I watched an interview of him one time and he was talking about his research process. And he was saying that he would always read things through the first time. And he would just write down anything that he thought seemed interesting. And he had discovered that if something seemed interesting to him, that readers would also find that interesting. And I had never really codified my process like that to think that's what I was doing. But when I heard him say that, I was like, oh yeah. And, and that, that was a lot what I did. You know, I followed her path. And each time she would go to a new place, I would think, what can I find out about this place? And it, it depended what place she was in, what thing I, I found interesting. But that that's the thing that I would then kind of build out. And it, it ended up feeling as if I was sort of, you know, writing a, a love letter to America, because I was writing, you know, each place, every one of those places, just like, you know, as you're driving through, and you want to stop and look at the monument, every place has its uniqueness to it, and it's, it's, it's interest to it. Um, and, and so yeah, you could research forever, but you kind of focus in on whatever seems cool and unusual, or surprising, I guess. I love that about your process. That's really interesting. And we've been lucky enough to host Nathaniel Philbrick a few times over the oh, years. Oh, have you? He's always have you heard riveting. Him say that? Not exactly that, but, uh -huh. but um, yeah, yeah, it was something that really marked me. So, yes, yeah, he's really a master of the, of the craft. Um, we are just about out of time, but I have one last horse question, which you sort of talked about this time as being the end of an era um, of the working horse. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered sort of how, if you wound up reflecting as you wrote on what that era says about our relationship to horses today. 
Well, I, I believe that, um, so the horse is the oldest domesticated animal. Um, we, it's been domesticated longer than, than dogs, uh, cats. And we have had this incredibly close relationship and we have influenced horses by selective breeding even before we really knew what that was. And more than any other animal, I believe that the horse is a reflection of our aspirations for ourselves. So the qualities that we see in horses are qualities that we wish for in ourselves. If courage and beauty and nobility and stamina and, um, and, and faithfulness, those are all things that we see and, and perceive in horses. They are all qualities that we want to aspire to in humans. And you really see this, Annie and Tarzan, I mean, when she first meets him, one of her first comments is that they sort of look alike. She's a New Englander and he's a New Englander and they're both kind of scruffy around the edges. But the main quality that they share is this kind of dogged toughness. Annie is a tough person in the very best kind of essence of American way that we believe in ourselves that we'll just, you know, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. And, and Target, Tarzan too, not handsome, not well-bred, not fancy, but dogged. And the two of them together, that's what they did. They were just like, we're going to just keep going. We're going to keep going. And her father would say, keep going till you get there. And that was her, her motto. Just, we're going to be, we're going to be tough. We're going to be rugged. Um, we're not fancy. We're not, you know, um, and, and that's, that's it. We, our relationship to horses up to that time was very natural. It was very much earned by a lifetime of just kicking around horses. Um, and our, our relationship to horses has changed a lot. Even the people that are the that are equestrians, generally speaking, they don't have the number of hours around animals that somebody like Annie Wilkins would have. To take care of a horse was just second nature to her. Um, to have a relationship with an animal, to, to have a, a mutual working relationship was very natural to her. And I always say, she never asked those horses to do anything that she wouldn't have asked herself to do. In her, in her world, people walked, you know, they wanted to go somewhere, that's what they did, they walked. Um, so we still love horses. And I think that you, we can't give up our relationship with them because it's too long and close and important a relationship. And that's why even people who don't think they're horse, horse lovers respond intuitively a lot of times to horse stories, and, and, the, and images of horses, they, it's, it's bred into them, it's bred into us as well. That's lovely. Um, I think that's actually a perfect note to end on. Um, this has been truly a lovely evening, Melanie and Elizabeth. We really appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk to us tonight. Well, thank you so much. I would like to add one piece of Saratoga Springs trivia, if I may. Yes, please. Um, which Oops. is that um, my last book, Finding Dorothy, uh, Frank and Maude had their honeymoon in Saratoga Springs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. That is lovely to know. So that's um, your Wizard of Oz connection. But good. I will, I will uh, <laughs> keep that stored away in my brain. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for being here. Please come back for another Northshire Live event. And you can order both The Ride of Her Life and The Children's Blizzard at Northshire.com. And uh, you got your links in your confirmation email to order them there also. Have we wished Elizabeth a happy birthday yet? We did. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. It must have happened before I came in. Thank you, Carolyn. Happy birthday. And thank you to the audience. Thank you so much to everyone who came. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm actually alone in my house and all my family's on the road. And so this is a very happy way to celebrate my birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy thank birthday. You. All right. Hey. Bye -bye. Okay. Have a bye. good night, everybody. Thank you. We need to talk. You and me are going to hear all about this. Oh my gosh! I know, Melanie. I owe you a conversation. I'm like, I gotta know. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.